Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event, Information Warfare in the Russian-Ukraine Conflict. I'm Mary Rose Papandrea. I'm a constitutional law professor at the UNC School of Law, and I'm also a leader of the University Strategic Initiative to Promote Democracy. This afternoon, we have convened a panel of experts to discuss information warfare in the Russian uh, attack on Ukraine. Russia's attack on the national sovereignty of Ukraine, the many human rights violations it's doing, and the massive displacement of peoples are issues gripping the world. Please consider attending Professor Harold Cole's lecture this evening at 5.30 about his efforts to sue Russia for Ukraine at the world's court. In addition, on April 5th, UNC's program for public discourse will continue this conversation with an event focusing on journalism and democracy. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on the role of propaganda, journalism, open source intelligence information, and the importance of media literacy during this war. This event is the result of a collaboration of professors and centers across the UNC campus. Specifically, I worked very closely with Professor Aaron Whitaker, a professor in the Peace, War, and Defense curriculum, as well as Professor Tori Ekstrand, a professor at the Husband School of Media and Journalism. In addition, I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Program for Public Discourse, the Center for Media Law and Policy, the Center for Information Technology and Public Life, also known as CTAP, and the Center for Slavic, Eurasian, and East European Studies. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Tim DeChant. He is a senior technology reporter for Ars Technica, where he covers technology and energy policy. In addition, he teaches science writing at MIT. We also are joined by Jocelyn Ford. Jocelyn wears many hats. She spent decades as a foreign correspondent based in Japan and China. She's also a filmmaker, having directed the award-winning film, Nowhere to Call Home, a Tibetan in Beijing. And she's now affiliated faculty with the University of Rhode Island Media Literacy Lab. We also have Daniel Johnson right here from UNC. He's a Roy H. Park fellow, a master degree candidate, soon to be PhD candidate at the Husband School for Media and Journalism. He served as an infantry officer and a journalist with the US Army in Iraq. We also have a surprise fourth panelist expected to join us at 4.30, Professor Harold Coe, the Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School. He's the, also the former legal advisor for the US State Department from 2008 to 2013. Professor Coe is visiting the UNC campus today and he hopes to join us at 4.30. So without further ado, we have so much to talk about. This is a very big topic. And so we're going to only scratch the surface. Um, Dan, if you don't mind, would you mind getting us started by telling us a little bit more about what exactly is information warfare and what role does it play in modern military theory? I'm Mary Rose, uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me to this talk. Um, when we talk about information warfare, especially from the military perspective, you have to understand that information warfare is just one part of modern military tactics. Uh, tactics information warfare take place, of course, in the information environment, but uh, it seeks to create changes and effects in the physical domain, like you know me you're sitting right here, the information domain, i.e. the internet, social media, and of course the cognitive domain, which is the minds of both your soldiers and the opponents and people throughout the world. Uh, the best way to look at information warfare is to understand that information is a battleground, one of many. It's fought by attacking ethnic flashpoints, spreading disinformation, jamming communications, infiltration, creating narratives through highly edited photos and videos. It targets stereotypes, deeply held beliefs, and culture narratives that goes beyond communication on the internet in the direction of the truth. It also contains efforts in the physical world to achieve change and accomplish objectives. All right, so you know, one part of information warfare could include cyber attacks. Um, this panel is not going to focus on that topic, but that's you know that can, that can be part of this. And but it's a it's a huge topic, and it hasn't, as far as I know, played as a, a big role yet. Although we've received warnings that we might expect some um, some cyber attacks, um, but instead we're focusing more on the control of information. Part of it, you said, uh, Daniel, when we spoke, is to win the hearts and minds of people, both the people in the in the country so that inside the country so that they will support uh, like the Russians to support the Russians or Ukrainians to support the defense 
Um, and uh, this is, is, is this a new thing, Daniel? Has this been around for a while? In information warfare, it's ain't, I hate to quote Sun Tzu because he's quoted every single time when we talked about war, but Sun Tzu said deception is the basis of all warfare, but so information has been a part of warfare since the beginning. But really what's new in Ukraine and with the, you know, the prevalence of social media technology is the scale and how it's being used. Uh, instead of, you know, using radio reports or television news releases to get news to front or put out my messages, now I could be on the front lines and post a message on social media where I talk about, you know, winning a battle with the Russians or the Russian soldiers I've captured or how me and my fellow soldiers are doing. I mean, in in one month of war in Iraq, uh, sorry, in one month of Ukraine, we probably have to equivalent like three or four or five months of information we would get from Iraq. When I was uh, when I was in Iraq in 2016, the Department of Defense was happy with getting information out, and you know, the same day, maybe two or three days. But the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense is putting out information within minutes. Within minutes, you can lose the battle for uh, control for narrative. Within minutes, you know, the perception of what's going on can rapidly change. Yeah, Jocelyn, would you mind, um, I know you know a lot about information warfare and prior conflicts as well. Would you mind offering some perspective on what you've seen in, in, in conflicts and wars before this time? Right. Well, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. And thank you, Daniel, for mentioning Sun Tzu and the art of war, the ancient Chinese philosopher, which is still very much alive and well in China today. I, I just want to add um, one comment from the 1991 Gulf War. And yes, from my gray hair, you can see I was around then. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I think that was there were there were some issues I had with with the way vocabulary is used in war. And we the word collateral da damage came up. This was basically the murder or killing of civilians, perhaps unintentional. And I was quite upset the way media used this and getting onto the media side of things. I think it is very important to always think of the terminology that is being used. For example, do we say the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Do we say the conflict in Ukraine? Do we say Russia's war on Ukraine? Do we say a US invasion of Iraq, Russia, you know, attack uh, uh, on Iraq, war on Iraq, in Iraq? Um, and, and this is just one point I wanted to bring up as Daniel has a lot of experience in the war scene from my side, which is trying to convey what I consider to be accurate information without giving favor to one side or the other, which is basically impossible if your government or your media organization is taking a side. Uh, but I think it's something that all people need to be aware of. And that's why I'm very excited. I hope this audience um, will at least come away with thinking about this every time you read a news story uh, about a conflict of one sort or another. That's it. You know, it's a great point, Joss. And also to highlight the role of journalism in information warfare. I mean, there certainly are attempts to control journalists, control what they say. Um, Daniel, maybe you could offer some thoughts on what is Russia doing right now to control what journalists have to say, for example, and other um, other forms of discourse about this war. I mean, one thing they are doing is targeting targeting journalists. I mean, we've had reports of one reporter from Time Magazine, and then another reporter for Fox News, and I think his um, the person who's helping if we were killed by Russian forces. It's 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 a tactic. It's it's an old tactic, but if they can't control the narrative, if they can't quickly change the narrative to say winning the war or actually doing good things for the Ukrainian people, then they're going to kill the messengers, and that's that's what we're seeing right now. Another thing they're doing is trying to shut down a discourse within their own nation, uh, trying to disconnect the Russian people from social media sites or the outside world, in order to make their narratives the only narratives that people hear and listen to. You know, one big thing, uh, there was recent news of uh, uh, criminal affiliated like tabloid site released that 9,000 Russian soldiers have been killed. And then they quickly retracted it, said it was a hack because the Russian government is saying that only like 400 to 500, 600 Russian soldiers have been killed. And, you know, just trying to do that, it's harder now than it was in 1991 because we have the internet and you know, <laughs> everyone connects to each other. But uh, Jocelyn brought up a good point about language. Even when I was in Iraq, I couldn't say the word kill. If I wrote that American soldiers were killing the enemy, I was told, no, we're not killing the enemy. We're destroying them. We're neutralizing. So you were told by DOD not yeah. to say killed? 
Yes, I mean, yeah, uh, they wanted to control the narrative. Uh, right, and just so Daniel, just to be clear, can you explain your role when you when you were a journalist for U.S. Army? Um, what you were not sort of operating as Jocelyn has been as a journalist, right? No, they have. So the U.S. Army has public affairs people. Some of them do like it's basically equivalent of ad PR stuff. They create create the little posters to make the Facebook posts to put out information. Of course, it's trying to make the uh, Department of Defense look good. The Department of Defense also has journalists that are also soldiers, and they go back and forth between like the PR roles and the news release roles. My job was basically to go out there, conduct news interviews, video footage, get all the stuff, write up a news report or a news release, put it on the DOD website, and then um, outside journalists from like CBS, NBC, the BBC could pull for that information and use for their news coverage. The, well, I, I just wanted you to mention that because I think it's important for us to realize that the control of the flow of information is part of something all governments do. Wartime, not wartime, you know, there's there's always a, a, a desire to control the narrative. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I do see a, a comment in the chat from uh, our friend Charlie Dunlop over at Duke and I um, Daniel, I, I don't know, is there evidence that the Russians targeted the journalists um, who have been killed and injured? I'm not, I'm not sure that we actually have that evidence. Um, is that, is that, have you heard that? No, there's no concrete proof of right. it right now. Right, it's right. But we do it. have, um, we do have a Russian, uh, Russian parliament passed a law making it a crime for any media organization to refer to what Russia's military is doing in uh, in Ukraine as a war or an invasion. So that's what Jocelyn was getting to, like trying to control the um, the discourse. And instead, they're in, they've instructed people, including people on social media, you know, laid people to call it a special military operation. Jocelyn, I think I saw you indicating comment. Yes, I just wanted to say that in past conflicts, as a member of the media, if you were press, you might assume that would protect you. My understanding, and I am obviously not in the Ukraine, is that in this conflict, it is a dangerous. It makes you a target. That is, but I again, I can't. Um, you know, I'm I'm not there. I'm not verifying right. that. But that is what I have heard. Right, and we don't. We certainly don't want to be a source of misinformation on a very panel exploring information and misinformation and disinformation. Um, now, Tim, if I could turn to you. Um, now, I, this, this may be beyond the scope of your knowledge, but you and I were just at an event last week with the media law um, uh, practitioners. And did you catch like, how are media organizations reacting to this Russian law? Are they pulling out? Are they working around it? How has it impacted their ability to cover? The war. Yeah, a lot of them tried to work with it in the, in the beginning is my understanding. Um, but I think recently they started pulling people out and trying to report from the outside um, mm -hmm. because I think it became increasingly clear that they weren't going to be able to do the job they needed to do within Russia. Um, right. There are, of course, people reporting from Ukraine um, and, and that's happening, people on the front lines. Um, but my understanding is that most many of the Moscow bureaus have shut down. Right. Thanks for sharing that with us. And, and Tim, now we know that Russia is trying to control the information that its people are getting in Russia. And how successful are they in controlling the information that the Russian people are getting about, about their aggression against Ukraine? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how much is getting out. Um, I know that they've been pretty successful in um, kind of harassing and shutting down some of the independent networks um, that are there. Uh, TV Rain, which was kind of the last standing independent TV network, uh, shut down, and I, I understand their journalists fled the country. Echo of Moscow, which has been around for years, also shut down. Um, other independent media, like the business publication Commerçant, is trying to adhere to the guidelines and operate kind of within this world as best they can. Um, other places are still plugging along. I guess The Insider, which is a Russian publication, is still, um, still running. Um, but they're, you know, they're doing their best to crack down on this. Um, my, my understanding of how people are getting the news is that it's increasingly kind of moving to places like Telegram, um, secure messaging platforms. Uh, and if any Russians kind of had VPN access to begin with, I think it's getting harder to get that. Um, but if they had that, you know, that's another place they're going to. Um, I guess Tor is another option if media organizations have those 
uh, services set up. I, I don't believe many do. I know Radio Free Europe, for example, has had some success uh, setting up uh, mirrors. So basically alternate URLs and servers uh, to try to get around the censorship um, that the firewall is you know, trying to impose within Russia. Um, and I don't know exactly how people are finding those. My guess would be that they're probably learning about the new, uh, you know, based on how this works elsewhere, uh, they would learn about the new uh, URLs, share them with their friends on a secure app like Telegram, and that's how it kind of spreads within these networks. And do you think that it's the whole population has access or is there perhaps a distinction between sort of the younger, more tech savvy or your urban population? Yeah, I'm guessing it skews younger and more urban. Um, these are people that had to be motivated to kind of get around these um, blocks in the first place, or they might have been interested in accessing social networks that might have been restricted previously. Um, so a lot of them and you. You know, you don't have to have a lot of tech savvy these days to use a, a VPN, a virtual private network, um, but neither is it, you know, as totally foolproof as, uh, you know, turning on your phone and opening your browser. Do you happen to know, Tim, how successful shortwave transmission has been? And we had a question in the chat about that. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know about that. I know people have started to try to bring that back, um, but I'm, I'm not familiar enough at this point, unfortunately. Now, in contrast, what's happening in, um, in Ukraine? Uh, the What kind of information access do those citizens have? So there, again, I'm not quite as well versed, but um, I don't think there's really any restriction. I think the biggest problem they have is just simply, are they able to access the internet? Um, you know, do they have cell service? Do they have Wi-Fi service? Um, my understanding is that the Ukrainian cell phone networks have I've done a remarkable job uh, staying active. Um, and I guess that's, they've kind of set up for this in anticipation of something like this happen, or they've had experience uh, in the Eastern provinces where they've been fighting uh, Russian forces already. Now, Daniel, you had, when we spoke earlier, you told me one interesting reason why you think there's still um, wireless access, why the Russians haven't knocked it out. Would you like oh, to share that? So I, some of the reports coming out of Ukraine is that Russia's actual like the Russian military, some of their communication networks actually rely on cell phone towers, which is bizarre, but that's part of the reason why they actually haven't destroyed cell phone towers <laughs> in the country because they need them in, to communicate. And generally we're talking about like, you know, military communications, you would, we would think that they would have encrypted radio communications that don't rely on civilian networks. That way I can't just listen in from like right here to Russian phone calls or the high frequency radio transmissions. That's not happening. There are literally accounts on Twitter where people have put out the Russian radio frequencies because it's unencrypted and said, you can listen to what they're doing right now. And so you have observers 7,000 miles away that can tell you at this moment, oh yeah, the Russians lost X amount of vehicles, X amount of tanks. They're here. They're going to attack this location soon. And that's, when you think about information warfare, part of it, offensive operations to gather, you know, enemy information. I just don't think anyone expected to be that simple that like you could literally just get an antenna and listen to what they're doing. Right. That's the shackle part. Yes. And Jocelyn's going to tell us a lot more about that in a moment. Uh, but thank you for, for mentioning that. And by the way, I mentioned we're getting some amazing questions in the chat. I'm trying to incorporate them as we go. Um, we may not get to all of them right now. We have time at the end for Q&A. So but please post, continue to post your questions. Um, uh, Jocelyn, would you mind offering just briefly what's going on in China? Because China is an important player here. Uh, what are the Chinese people hearing about this, uh, about uh, this war? Yeah, thank you for that question, because I do think China is incredibly relevant to the, obviously, to the future of the globe as the world's second largest economy and as a country with great ambitions globally. And I often find in conversations there is too little information in the US or too little understanding about the information environment that uh, the largest, the most populous country is living in. So basically, they are repeating Russian, uh, the Russian explanations. Uh, it is a special military operation. The cause of this, it is the US fault. It is that NATO's fault that there is a conflict. And the point of view is, I think, twofold. Uh, one is, is public opinion manipulation. Uh, China sees the United States as the big adversary in this world. Uh, Russia is to help <laughs> support China 
in its in its ambitions. And the second, which uh, a professor, a Beijing professor, Tung Zhou, uh, mentioned yesterday in a webinar I was on, which I think is worth repeating, is that this also forms the information environment for the advisors to the government and the public intellectuals and the intellectuals, and that drives the discussion. And again, this is not unique to China. We have think tanks in the United States which drive the direction of discussion and debate. And so I, I, I think those are uh, two reasons for this. Now, I should say that um, I do have many friends in China. Um, I uh, Very dear friends. And some of them uh, write me uh, about the distress that they feel um, about this information environment. And this, if I can just share for a second, a screenshot from uh, a, a young man who is a student. And uh, are we sharing? I'm not sure if this is working. There we go. Um, and he he wrote me that he, after the, the meeting between President Xi and President Biden, yeah, he yeah. went to the White House uh, website for a readout and he was surprised. He says, um, the US readout, they use the word invasion. Remember in China, they're using the, Jap the, the Russian vocabulary, uh, special military operation. Um, and he says, but there has never been any mention of the invasion in our media and focusing on not it's focusing on Nazi forces in Ukraine and NATO's expansion mm -hmm. to Ukraine. And and so though the um, the the probably the majority of the population I would see do not say do not go outside their information zone and there may be parallels in Russia, but the young people um, have been brought up on social media and they may some of them are living in a different information hmm. environment. Well, thanks for sharing that screenshot. I, I found it personally very moving to see it in sort of uh, black and white like that. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that we've heard commentators talk about, and this is for you, Dan, to get us started, is that um, they've noted that the Biden administration has tried to beat Russia at its propaganda game. Um, so specifically on January 23rd, the British government with US support released details of a purported Russian plot to install a pro-Moscow regime in Kiev. And on February 3rd, the Biden administration released information about a fake attack that Russia was planning to stage and film a propaganda video. And, they, and the US has released details about Russian troop movements on the border. Um, why do you think the US has taken this um, sort of proactive approach? Has this been effective? I think it has been effective. And I think, I mean, we've learned, we've learned from like uh, 2016 and previous years that unfortunately, true or not, a lot of the information that gets put out there first, that's usually the narrative people go with. And it's hard to dispute those narratives, even though they're false. We see it with COVID misinformation. We see it with information about stolen elections, stuff like that. So actually we get it out in the front saying, hey, the Russians or this entity are trying to confuse you or lie to you. That's a narrative that people are going to hear. So now they're probably going to be at a higher, but hopefully, hopefully if all things go well. And I would say the United States military, the United States government has learned a lot from uh, Russian hybrid warfare, basically their, their information warfare tactics with like on the ground tactics they used in 2014, you Ukraine. They were trying to find ways to counter that because that's that's been one of the bigger national security threats, you know. And that's uh, in 2016, based, uh, I was part of the U.S. Army's Tactical Information Operations course where they, you know, taught us information operations tactics. And what did we use as the samples? The Russians, the Russians. Yeah. So it's, so I would say in this case, if Russia did not evade, okay, at least the Biden administration tried. They did evade. So the Biden administration intelligence agencies were proactive. They're being shown to be pretty on the money throughout the entire time. And it's also built trust in what we're saying and also what the Ukrainian military government is saying. And that's very important, especially in a war of narratives. Thanks, Daniel. Now, Jocelyn, what challenges do journalists face though when, uh, and lay consumers of information about the war when classified information is being revealed like this? Um, are there reasons that we should be more trusting of it than perhaps the infamous intelligence information about the weapons of mass destruction that Colin Powell presented to the UN Security Council to justify the invasion of Iraq. Oh, you're muted. 
you know, we thank you very much. At least once. Thank you very much. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think that's a very important question. Uh, the media, you know, demands uh, explanations in general for what is the basis for making this assumption. Now, what happens when when that is not that the supporting evidence is not given? It, it's it's very tough. Um, do you go with it? Do you not go with it? And I think the important point is that those caveats that the reading, the consumer, the information consumer needs to be well educated and the journalist organization, I think should be doing a, in general, a better effort to flag information that either can't be um, confirmed, you know, and there are ways of saying that in the article, but sometimes they're not bold enough. And as Daniel has said, it's that first impression, that first headline that's on your social media, that tends to be what people believe in without going deeper. And I do think in this era of really quick information, we need to do a better job of flagging that in general, what is substantiated and what isn't, even among the most typically reliable news organizations. Otherwise, we end up with the, as you mentioned, the Colin Powell uh, situation where, um, you know, perhaps he was fed misinformation or disinformation, misinformation being unintentionally repeating something that is incorrect and disinformation being intentionally deceiving. Um, I see Professor Coe is here, so. Yes, <laughs> but thank you, Justin. So Professor Coe, Harold Coe, so great to see you. Um, uh, we're delighted to have you here at UNC today and specifically to have you on our panel, uh, we were just talking about the Biden administration's proactive release of classified information about Putin's plans um, to create some propaganda to justify his invasion of Iraq. And then Jocelyn was offering us um, some concerns jo uh, journalists have when they have uh, classified information that's released and how they handle uh, determining the veracity of that, uh, of the viewpoint presented by, uh, by the US government. Uh, but, so I think we're about to turn into thinking more about um, the role of social media in, um, in this conflict and particularly the, the rise of open source intelligence. And if you don't mind, uh, Harold, if Co, if you're prepared to tell us a little bit about what you saw when you were in the State Department with um, open source intelligence is my understanding is that, of course, the government takes advantage of um, open source intelligence. And did you, you, I think your time at the State Department coincided with a massive rise in uh, the use of social media and smartphones. Did you see that when you were at the State Department? Yes, thank you, Mary Rose, for including me. Um, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, every morning I would get to work um, and I would read cables, classified cables, starting from the most classified to uh, the least classified, most classified is sensitive compartmentalized information where only some people had access. There were, you know, maybe 20 billets in the government. And then um, often I would see cables that would say something like a massacre occurred on the outskirts of Jakarta last night and um, four people were killed and three people were injured. Uh, at that point, I would open my email and I'd get emails from, you know, Human Rights Watch, and they would say massacre occurred in Jakarta, and 20 people were killed, and 100 people were injured. At which point you send an email to, uh, over whatever level of classification is appropriate, to the embassy in Jakarta, and you say, um, clearly there was a massacre last night, but how many people were killed and how many people were injured? And then they would write back what was in the super classified cable. And then you write back, well, the open source information says there's a much larger number. Hmm. And suddenly they come back and say, well, actually, yeah, it was a little bit of a larger number, but we couldn't verify it. We don't think it was as many as 100 injured. So then you'd sort of gradually, asymptotically verge on what was the correct hmm. answer. And we had to produce human rights reports. And very often the reports were amalgam of what we were getting through classified material and unclassified material. Uh, the other point to be made about classified material is that uh, the US government's information is massively overclassified. Um, most of the stuff I read that was classified should have been unclassified the next day. Um, you know, you'd read a more thorough account in the New York Times the next day. <laughs> 
but very often they didn't sunset the classification. So the classification would continue long past the right date. They started to fix this when I left the government about the time, because when you would write an email, you'd have to set the classification of the email at the time you were writing it. So if I'm, I, I'll tell you the worst story. Um, at the National Security Council, every person at the National Security Council has four computers on their desk, ranging from least classified to the most classified, super classified. The most super classified one, we only had one computer in the entire State Department that received such emails. And I was on this super classified system one night at about nine o'clock, dealing with this very delicate problem with a guy from, from um, the NSC. And at the very end, he writes, I'm going up to New Haven, New Haven, Connecticut, my hometown this weekend. So I go home, it's about three in the morning. And I get this call from the State Department Operations Center. They say, you've just gotten us an email at the highest level of classification. You, under our protocol, you have to come and read it like now. And so at three o'clock in the morning, I have to get dressed, drive down to the State Department, go into the safe, get all this stuff. And I log on and the guy has written to me, which pizza place do you prefer, Pepe's or Sally's? <laughs> the problem was because he was operating at the highest level of classification. He just sent the last email on the system. It was not classified at all. So um, this leads to a huge amount of frustration. Um, and also in many cases, uh, government officials are both classifying things and leaking things and often leaking things at the direction of other government officials. So it, it create a crazy system. But I would say open source has been generally extremely helpful except for things like Julian Assange and uh, WikiLeaks. You know, Assange is not a hero. He released gigantic amounts of information with no lead time. And uh, what happened was when this information got leaked, probably a hundred human rights activists were in severe jeopardy of their lives. And it happened on a Friday and I, I was working for Hillary Clinton at the time, there was just a massive worldwide effort to get these people to safety. And in one case, they literally brought a person down a flight of stairs while guys with guns were coming up the other flight of stairs. And when they asked Assange about it, why did you just release this information open source without any kind of protection? He said, nobody got hurt which is about the most irresponsible thing you could say. He, he put them all at jeopardy. He didn't care about it. Um, they would have been killed if massive steps weren't taken to, to address the issue. And then he's painting himself to be a hero. So I, I, I didn't think he should be a, a, a hero at all. Uh, so, uh, Professor Ko, one thing um, I'd like to get your thoughts on is the role of social media uh, specifically um, in both being helpful and maybe harmful to uh, to the to the cause, whichever side you're on, but particularly think about here in the U.S. And this has echoes of some domestic issues we've had. There have been so many debates recently about um, controlling false information, misinformation, disinformation on social media. Um, is that something that you think the the social media companies in this war should be called to account to uh, do more to control uh, the dissemination of false information? Yes, I think they've been, you know, newspapers don't publish, knowingly publish false information, or they get sued for libel. And the idea that social media companies can let people post false information and get away with it uh, and just blame it on the content provider is, is wrong. I mean, just a clear example, it, it's clear the Russians are trying to post information every day that claims they've killed Zelensky. And they haven't, um, at least not today. But it's a seriously, it's a kind of thing that would really damage the morale of the Ukrainian resistance. And so if they're publishing that kind of stuff as a fake, somebody has to rebut it and say that it's false. Um, now, the way that Zelensky has generally been reacting to it is by himself broadcasting uh, because he's been able to have an unprecedented, I mean, he's a, a tremendous media performer 
and he's managed to maintain his access to the internet, wh whether that's because of Elon Musk's satellite or not, I don't know. But it seems to me that somebody who engages in hate speech or other kinds of things or uh, th speech that threatens violence uh, ought to be kicked off of these social media platforms. And if you don't mind, Professor Koa, Tim, would you mind offering um, just some examples of what you've heard social media companies trying to do? These yeah, days? so social media companies have kind of, um, they were slow to respond to this because I think they're, they're not used to dealing with, um, I mean, they're just simply not used to dealing with state media actors in this way, right? They're used to dealing with inauthentic behavior from places like the Internet Research Agency, uh, you know, and other kind of like more clandestine actors. Um, so what YouTube did, they've probably been, I would say, the most aggressive. Uh, they booted Russian state media. They did it pretty quickly in Europe. It took them several days to go more global. Um, Facebook and Twitter have, you know, been a little slower, so they've been reducing the reach of Russian state media, but it's all still out there. Um, and Twitter has introduced a tour service to try to get around some of that stuff. So these are some of the kind of more proactive steps. But as I said, they were really kind of slow to do some of this. Um, and I think they're, I think they're struggling with the asymmetry, asymmetry of the situation where they're allowing Russian state media to use their platforms, even though they're not giving them the same boost and promotion they would have previously. Um, but at the same time, the Russian government is largely denying its citizens access to these platforms. Um, so Russia is in, enjoying the free speech that they're denying to their own citizens. Um, and I think that asymmetry is something that they're grappling with. And I, I don't think they're, I think right now they're thinking about it from a markets perspective as opposed to a, a free speech perspective, even though oftentimes they'll uh, kind of cloak their behaviors in, uh, you know, that, that they're forwarding the mission of free speech. Uh, Professor Ko, uh, you may have seen today's story in the New York Times, and I think there was also an NBC story a week ago about the um, Soviet uh, media amplifying, I mean, the Russian media amplifying Tucker Carlson and other right-wing um, uh, commentators. Is that, uh, is there anything to be done about that? Um, well, you know, I, I, I think that the social media was slow to kick Trump off. And I think they're slow to kick people from Fox News off, even if they're um, promoting messages that either spawn hate or violence or affirmative disinformation. So um, that kind of thing should be addressed by journalistic standards. One of, but one of the problems Fox News has is their most famous commentators, whether it's Bill O'Reilly or um, Tucker Carlson or other people are not held to those basic standards. And, um, you know, if you have a, a company called Fox News and it doesn't meet journalistic news standards, there has to be some alternative method of enforcement. But, you know, we don't live in a society where standards are imposed on news organizations by regulatory agencies or courts. And that's what lets people like that get away with it. Right, and of course, I you know if Tucker's on uh, on broadcast television and cable television, he's not actually using social media necessarily, although maybe getting amplified that way. Um, and instead, his uh, his speech is protected by the First Amendment, which runs in you know headlong, I'm sure, into what many people would like to see. Um, so, um, Harold, I know you may not be with us for for the rest of our time. I just wanted to see if you could give us a quick. Um, understanding. Does international law have anything to say on uh, disinformation and propaganda? You uh, you mentioned to me the um, June two, 2021 Oxford Statement on International Law Protections in Cyberspace, the Regulation of Information Operation and Activities. Is there, in a, just a couple minutes, could you tell us a little bit about what international law has to say? Um, yeah, a group of us started in uh, during the pandemic something called the Oxford Process uh, about international law protections in cyberspace. And what we decided was that international law experts were too reluctant to say the obvious things. I mean, you know, you know there, there's no absolutely no justification for using the internet to attack a hospital during a war, or to disrupt vaccine research, or to rig an election. And so even though these are not the subject of treaties, there's a widespread acceptance that these violate 
uh, rules of non-intervention, international law of war, or human rights law. So we decided that if we got about 150 people together, we could make more definitive statements. And one of them, which is the one that you mentioned, Mary Rose, which I think you could send around to your class, is the Oxford Statement about information operations. So it's very clear, for example, you know, if, if you're gonna have an election and uh, somebody sends out a notice saying the election is gonna take place at this place and misdirects people to go there, um, that's affirmatively stealing people's votes by telling them a falsehood. So that, that shouldn't be protected as speech. Obviously speech that instills or incites violence in the immediate term. Uh, ought to be a subject of concern. We saw that during the Rwandan genocide when Radio Mill Colleen was calling for uh, people to be slaughtered by saying, you know, kill the cockroaches. And they, they were the subject of a, a war crimes prosecution. Um, and then I think um, also information operations that are designed clearly to mislead people. Um, it's a, you know, it, if you told somebody take a something that's not a vaccine and uh, you know to jeopardize their own health, you'd be threatening their livelihood or their life. Um, it's a little bit harder when all you're doing is misleading them. And the question is, when are lives protected by the First Amendment or Article 19 of um, the International Human Rights Law? And you know the United States uh, libel law under New York Times versus Sullivan is more deferential to mistakes and lies. If you can't prove their lies, you don't get a chance to sue for libel. But I, I think in particular in other countries, hate speech is much more strictly regulated by the European human rights law. So I think my point is that there is a body of international law emerging and we should be invoking it, citing it and clarifying it, which will take time. But I think that clearly there are no fly zones. And we had to call out the no-fly zones, even if we can't spell out the rules in all the gray areas. Thank you for, for offering that. And I did put in the chat the link to the um, June 2021 statement that uh, Harold Cohen and I were just talking about. Um, I'd like to talk about amateur OSINT. Um, Jocelyn, I, I know that you have uh, been studying this very carefully. So it's a form of um, citizen journalism, if you will. Um, lots of, uh, you know, but there are also experts involved in the collection, the analysis of information. Would you mind telling the audience about what you're seeing? Right. And, and I think this uh, dovetails very well with what uh, Dr. Koh was saying in terms of checks and balances on the intelligence on the professional intelligence community you've got a lot of information out there now we've got cell phones we have satellite images we have geolocating so that the public at large it can do a lot of the work that previously was uh, basically the the realm of, of professional intelligence officers and i think this can play several roles and is it, it is very important in fact i would argue that it should be a basic uh, literacy skill for all information consumers, which means everybody in the world, basically. Um, and that school should be introducing at least the technique so that people have an idea of how they can do this themselves, because it is empowering. Not that we all have time. It takes time. It takes expertise. But we, but there are groups. Or the, the, the other point, uh, which is important, is that is a very collaborative effort in the um, so-called so OSINT, which is open source intelligence. Um, some people say OSINT, some people say OSINT, some people say OSINT, doesn't matter. You may have seen it in the headlines. Don't be afraid of it because it basically a lot of these skills we already have in terms of searching on the internet. Um, you can do a reverse image ser search, for example, and find out whether this image that says it is one thing um, has been used previously in another context and, and that sort of thing. So I, I, um, I think there, you know, one can be hopeful that uh, this will help keep uh, what, what Dr. Koh was talking about earlier in terms of the you know, information de declassifying, et cetera. Maybe it can move that process along a little bit faster. Mary yes, Rose. It, yeah, oh, go ahead, yes. One desperate need um, that I hope we'll see coming together in the next few weeks is the need for a um, um, authoritative information repository of evidence 
about war crimes in Ukraine and also about um, civil reparations and destruction. So, you know, we're, we're all accustomed now to the fact that we have our COVID cards and we take a picture of them, we upload them somewhere, and then, you know, we, we get to go into a restaurant. But, you know, we have in real time, people are fleeing from cities in Ukraine and they turn around and their home is being destroyed and they have a chance to take a video of it, but that's all. And the question is, what do they do with this information? And is there a way that we can set up um, authoritative evidentiary repositories um, in which um, later on, when accountability and reparations mechanisms are set up, people can have uh, adjudicated claims where they can go back and seek relief. Because, you know, refugees don't tend to take records with them. And, um, but everybody now has a cell phone. So this, this uh, Open Society, George Soros's program has already committed 25 million, a lot of which will go to this archive. Um, a lot of the uh, private money um, being thrown around on this issue should be directed toward this question. And the real question is who will actually become the, the equivalent of the Syrian Human Rights Observatory or something like that. But that's a desperate need in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. Now, Harold, are you staying with us till five or do you have to leave yeah, early? Till five, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, you know, we have so many questions and only uh, 11 minutes. So uh, I, one of the questions is Jocelyn about media literacy. And so I wanted to just turn back to you to talk more about what tips you have for um, uh, us uh, in the audience. Uh, the students and professors for how they should uh, go about consuming information about this war. Sure, and I think it's not just about this war, as I'm well, saying. Yes. I think it is <laughs> crucial. Um, there are a couple of simple things that I think everybody should do all the time. And then there's some things, if those of you out there who would like to be journalists, I think you should start doing. So on the simple side, you know, look at the date and the source of information that comes your way, regardless of if it's on social media or in mainstream media and become familiar with some of the more uh, reliable media. However, I do want to be careful. I, I, as a professional journalist, I look at the byline of who wrote in the New York Times and I follow them and I see where the mistakes are, where there's, you know, if there's shabby writing or something like this. Um, I keep track of that, and that affects my view of whether a given publication is, um, you know, retains a high level of, of quality, uh, quality control, editing, et cetera, et cetera, whether they do their fact checking or not. So when you're reading, you pay attention to whether there are corrections. Um, pay attention, as I said, to the source and the date of an article. Um, do and not share information that you yourself have not felt is from a quality source, um, especially on the war. But I think especially in wartime and especially in fast moving breaking stories, mm -hmm. expect initial information that Daniel mentioned is so important because it creates that first impression. Expect it to have mistakes and check back later. I think that's really important in wartime, um, not to stick to your first impression. Um, for those who want to become journalists, I would say, you know, start following the, the media, uh, the, per, the people that you think are reliable and and keep a long term memory of that. I mean, I to be frank, I mean, I know people who work for very respected organizations, but they're better writer. They're better writers, flowery writers, but not as careful with the facts all the time. Mm. So these are things to be aware of for those of you who are going into the profession. Um, there's a lot more, but right, yes, but I appreciate time. that tip. You know, the fast-moving um, nature of of how information's coming in that you need to be very a careful consumer. Daniel, did you want to add something? Yes. And I did also tie into that. I did see a few questions about you know, is the role of social media in the conflict in Ukraine is this a good or bad thing? What about a uh, coordinated Russian disinformation attacks? And I know Charles uh, Dunlap asked, asked about is information now considered a war fighter function? So I would say. The social media, it's it's neutral. I mean, as much as as much as social media is helping us understand what's going on in Ukraine, it could also be used for ill. 
as much as social media could be used for hatred and hate, hate speech and also allow organizations like Black Lives Matter to organize and you know, spread their movement throughout the nation. Uh, when you think about coordinated disinformation attacks by Russia and then uh, information as war fighting tactic, I know that the United States military has recently announced like a couple of weeks ago, the US Marines have tied together like psychological operations civil operations and public affairs into creating slots like influence officers or influence uh, expert, like literally influences in the name because they understand that the power that information narrative has on how uh, conflicts are perceived, how people respond to you, and then <laughs> whether you have the political willpower to continue to fight. But the big thing about even coordinating disinformation efforts and social media and misinformation in general is that Disinformation won't help Russia take, say, Kiev. The big thing, thing that's helping the Ukrainians right now in their narrative for information warfare conflict is that they're achieving victories on the battlefield. Information is a tool like artillery fire or you know, gunfire supplies to achieve a strategic objective. But if you're not achieving that strategic objective, information, it won't actually get you there. You know, I can't say we're taking Kiev right now, then like 100 Russian tanks appear in the middle of the city. No, it's not possible. So that's what um, people have done. Uh, one of the big things, I hope it's a big takeaway here is that the physical and information wars are interconnected. They play off each other. If the Ukrainians haven't been, didn't successfully defend a country as they did in the first few days of the invasion, we would be looking at a very different information and narrative sphere, so. Yeah, thank you for that. That's that's great, Daniel. It really helps tie together the role that information warfare pay, plays in the overall um, military uh, uh, objectives. Um, uh, Professor Harold Coe, I have a question for, for you from the, well, it wasn't directed to you, but I think you'd be the best one to answer it. Um, what do you think of a report from Human Rights Watch that, um, that says that Hira Ukrainian authorities should stop posting on social media and messaging apps videos of captured Russian soldiers that expose them to public curiosity, showing them humiliated or intimidated um, the Human Rights Watch has said that this violates uh, protections under the Geneva Conventions. Have, do you have any reaction to that comment? Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, in the Geneva Conventions, there are rules against subjecting um, like prisoners of war to uh, inhuman, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or humiliating circumstances. That, that was what was violated. Um, by uh, the treatment of the prisoners at Abu Ghraib. And, um, you know, the Ukrainian authorities, th there's a fine line between uh, having the Russian soldiers say that they don't know what's going on or that they've been misled by Putin and their, their military leaders and, you know, actually humiliating them as, as a group. So, you know, Human Rights Watch is the, the benefit of being a very large organization with a lot of funding which has basically proceeded without fear or favor. And I, I think on this one, they're right. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question, um, I'm, whoever wants to take it. Maybe Tim, I'll ask you and then you can say what you want. Um, it has to do with the uh, propaganda. So the question is that some analysts of propaganda have recently claimed that censorship is increasingly unnecessary. So this concern about social media censoring false information is unnecessary because you know, not only is it hard to enforce, but its effects can be achieved by sowing uncertainty, doubt, and ultimately quiescence by turning on a fire hose of uh, falsehood. Is this claim overstated? Like how, how, what is your reaction to this idea that we don't really need to worry about censorship? Yeah, I think so. I think it, one place we can look at that is uh, disinformation around COVID and vaccines. Um, and there've been studies that have shown that like once you start uh, reducing the spread of some of the misinformation and disinformation around that, um, you stop to see, you, you start, the, the uptake of conspiracy or theories and stuff like that uh, definitely goes down. So that's not to say that this is censorship per se, um, I guess you could call it that, um, but this idea that we should just uh, allow unfettered speech in any realm and that just, you know, more speech is what counters disinformation, um, I think it's, I think that's largely been disproven that, um, you know, in some cases that may work, but uh, you sometimes want to control things a little bit more so that you don't have um, 
So you don't just have outright lies flooding uh, social networks and stuff like that, because it's very easy to pump that stuff out. You know, they are uh, oftentimes a lot catchier, right? The truth is more nuanced. And so um, trying to balance that field a little bit, I think is important. Anyone want to add to that? I think increasingly we need information validators because there's so much information um, that many things could be said that have an air of truth. And so the fact that many newspapers have started explainers or um, fact check um, or instant fact check is very helpful because at least then somebody now knows whether something that's posted is completely right, part right, or completely false. And um, without that, it's very hard to proceed um, w without knowing whether what you're reading is, is, um, is, has some grain of truth in it. Yes, and, I, and it, it is always interesting when you see the mainstream media adopting some of the techniques of citizen journalists and the, the OSINC. Uh, you know, we see the New York Times, for example, engaging in its own OSINC um, operations. It's, it's really quite interesting. Um, oh, here's an interesting question. It just came in. I'm sorry. This will be our last one because we only have a minute. Um, what do you think is the biggest difference between how Russia is pushing their narrative now and how the U.S. and other countries have pushed narratives in the past? Oh, gosh, we need a whole other hour for that. Um, anyone want to take that in you our know, last minute? Daniel? I, I, you know, we, we have um, the U.S. Information Agency it's now part of the public diplomacy of the United States, the Voice of America, Radio Marti, Radio Free Europe. Um, but they adhere to journalistic standards and they criticize the United States and they hire professional journalists. Um, you know, I, I think that they are far more reliable than many of the elements of Fox News. So uh, I don't, I, you know, I, I think what you see on RTL or other, you know, TASS is just pure propaganda. But uh, what the US is putting out is filtered through a journalistic mechanism that meets journalistic standards. And I, I very frequently had Voice of America uh, reporters say very, very critical things about the United States to give the full picture. And you wanna add last word, Daniel? I would say on the DOD side, <laughs> one thing that they did prove was that don't edit photos. Don't don't lie. Don't lie in your writing. Now, whether the full truth will get out is a totally different subject. But I would say that's the biggest issue. We were taught, we were told that try to be as honest as you can to support whatever strategic messages. But don't just say something crazy like uh, American troops. There were we just took entire cities. No, it's it's not true. That's that's not the way we're supposed to operate. So I would say that's the biggest difference between our information operation efforts and the ones that say Russia in this case and in, in previous cases. And Jocelyn, last word. Yeah, I would just say inoculate the public. I know it's really difficult, but everybody needs media literacy skills to read through this and read through what Daniel has been telling us that, that what he is, what his bosses are telling him to do. We all need to know the motivation. Is it to make money? Is it to be famous? Is it for public interest information? Full disclosure, I come from public radio background. So I think that if we had more than, you know, somewhat like 30, 50% of information from a public interest perspective, not for profit, that we would have a different debate in this country and we would have different social relations. So Thank inoculate you, Jocelyn. yourselves. We are going to have to leave it there. I am so grateful to all of you, Tim DeChant, Harold Coe, Daniel Johnson. Jocelyn Ford. This will be posted online on the Program for Public Discourse YouTube channel. So please share it with your friends. Thank you for joining us for this very important conversation.